The Night Beat starts right now. A series of quakes has shaken up part of South Texas. You can see them right here in orange, concentrated right in that area. The strongest hit Carnes County just after midnight. Its epicenter falls right near Fall City, about an hour southeast of San Antonio. People who live there tell the night team's Daniela Ibarra and photojournalist Gavin Nesbitt it's the price they pay for growth. It's the rumble around town. Fall City rattled by an overnight earthquake. Literally and mentally, yeah, it was it was pretty terrifying. It just sounded like a helicopter going over or something like that. We had thought that an 18 wheeler had crashed into the house or the yard. It was so loud. Uh, it even woke my grandfather up and he's 91. The 4.7 magnitude quake the latest felt in a series of them. Probably more than 20 in the past two weeks. It seems like every other day there's something shaking. Some neighbors believe the growing oil and gas industry is responsible. We have a lot of fracking going around, like going on around our house. I think it's probably the oil and gas activity. I've noticed here um, off the highway, there's more 18 wheelers going by. It's a booming business bringing growth to Fall City. With all growth comes destruction, right, in every city, so. I don't know, this is just a little different, I guess. This woman says her busted window from the quake is just a scar caused by the growing pains. If I have to sacrifice a window breaking to allow for America to get stronger because we have our own fuel independence and to allow my family to have like generational wealth, then that's the price I have to pay. Danielle Ebar that was Daniela Ibarra. Earthquakes have been happening more often in South Texas, so why is that? Well, we have a whole case that explains dedicated to that topic. Justin Horn did such a great job. Check it out. You can watch Explains anytime on demand on KSAT Plus, KSAT.com, or the KSAT YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code to check it out. Well, this southwest side, southeast side home took on tens of thousands of dollars worth of fire damage this afternoon, and crews say the wind played a massive part in that damage. Investigators say the fire started in the back of the home on the 3800 block of Meeks Avenue, but the wind was so strong today that fire quickly spread straight to the attic. Crews still don't know what started the fire, but they did confirm no one was hurt. That strong wind is something Army of Montgomery has been monitoring. We've been talking about it for a while, as well as the incoming drop in temperatures. So Mia, how long is this wind going to stick around? Well, thankfully, Courtney, a lot of those wind gusts that we saw earlier this afternoon have already started to die down, and it's going to be much calmer as we head through the overnight hours and even more so into the back half of the weekend. But now our focus turns to the cold temperatures. Right now, low 40s in place because those winds have died down. We've got drier air in the works as well. Dew points right now down into the 20s, so low humidity back into south central Texas. Combine all of those ingredients together and temperatures are going to fall through the overnight. Low 30s expected right around 32 degrees for us here in San Antonio by 7 a.m. Potentially a few upper 20s and the higher elevations up into the hill country. So make sure all those light freeze preparations are taken before headed to bed tonight, mainly the potted plants as well as the pets. After that though, that cold start, we've got a beautiful day in store. Plenty of sunshine, but still cool into the afternoon. High temperatures in the upper 50s. And again, there are those calmer winds in place as well. If you like the cooler weather, enjoy tomorrow because a warming trend quickly takes over into next week. We're going to time all of that out and get you those details coming up a little bit later in the newscast, Courtney. All right, thanks so much, Mia. Well, after years of delays, a construction project on the west side now might have a change of plans. Seven years ago, voters first approved a bond that would approve money for the Las Palmas Library to be renovated. And seven years later, it pretty much looks the same. The night team's Avery Everett walks us through a construction update and how the city says rising construction costs are making project plans change. It's just giving back to the community what the community is investing in. Your face lights up when you talk about this library. I just, I grew up in this area probably a mile away from here. Uh, so I know the value of what it brings to this part of town. Closed down and chained up. This is what the Las Palmas Library looks like off Castroville Road. And it's all because of an ongoing construction project. It's going to be great. People like Delia Ramirez Trimble and Linda Arange have been advocating for this project since 2017. We fought for a long time. But seven years later, it looks 
almost the same. Renovations for the library are backed by two different bond projects. One in 2017 and the other in 2022. District 5 says about 80% of the 2017 bond project is complete, but now modifications are being made to the original 2022 bond project. When we heard that, it was like, oh no, but again, what can we do? The city held a meeting this week for neighbors to hear updates on construction. The news kind of was all bad. Neighbors say the biggest concern is prices. The city says the bond budget for the project is no longer enough to cover everything. And the project is going to take longer. While the list of changes was vague, what we gather is that the revisions include removing a bathroom, window and ceiling changes to the plaza area, and deleting storage and support space for a meeting room. Neighbors say they want more details. Driving by, some neighbors say it's even hard to recognize that this is the Las Palmas Library. Obviously, it's temporarily closed right now, but it's also worn down. And this sign shows that. Take a look at some of this peeling right here. And that's why neighbors say they're so determined to stay on top of this project. If you look around this area, you're not going to see bowling alleys. You're not going to see theaters. You're not going to see a whole lot of the things that a lot of other areas of the city have. But this is a wonderful library. Boards may be up. But spirits here across Las Palmas are not yet broken. The proposed design changes have to be approved by the library's board of trustees, and that meeting will be held on March 27th at 4.30 p.m. here at the McCrellis Branch Library. As far as how long the Las Palmas location is going to be closed, they are expecting it to reopen in early 2025. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Thanks, Avery. Texas leaders have activated a statewide Amber Alert for a child they say is in grave or immediate danger. This is William C.I. The 17 year old boy was last seen Wednesday night in Pearland, Texas, just south of Houston. He was wearing a gray and maroon long sleeve T-shirt with black pants. If you see him or know where he is, please call the Pearland, Texas Police Department immediately. Meanwhile, in Polk County, a 42 year old person of interest is facing charges in the disappearance of an 11 year old girl. Investigators believe his Chevy Suburban was involved in the disappearance of Audrey Cunningham in Livingston, Texas. She was last seen after being dropped off at her bus stop Thursday morning. Despite the arrest, Texas DPS investigators are still looking for Audrey. If you have any information, report it immediately. Tomorrow, it will have been a week since Gen Genesee Moreno walked into the Lakewood Mega Church in Houston and opened fire. Her seven-year-old son and a 57-year-old man caught in that crossfire between her and officers already patrolling the church. She was shot and killed, and while that child and man are still recovering from those gunshot wounds, the Lakewood congregation is recovering from a near nightmare scenario. After no services all week, People will return to Lakewood tomorrow for three services, two in the morning and a Spanish speaking service in the afternoon. Lakewood church officials would not go into details, but did say they will have, quote, appropriate security for tomorrow's services, as well as some help from the Houston Police Department, which already patrols places of worship all over the city. It's important that people who don't look like me are interested in the things that are happening in this community. In order for us to learn about black history, that history has to be preserved and those stories told. Coming up in case that explains, we take you to three places in San Antonio where that effort is underway every single day. Plus, the two lone Republicans are hot on the campaign trail this weekend, trying to prove to voters they deserve their vote to be the next president. All while the current commander in chief is doing everything he can to get Congress to act on a plan to help Ukraine. The details when we return next on the Night Beast. Former President Trump has boots on the ground in two different battleground states this weekend, as his only remaining Republican rival, Nikki Haley, continues to crisscross her home state of South Carolina to drum up support ahead of the Palmetto State's primary election. In the White House, President Biden and his administration are urging Congress to get something done to help Ukraine as the war-torn country nears the two-year mark against its war in Russia. ABC's Johnny Fernandez tells us why the president says there's too much at stake. Former President Donald Trump vowing to appeal after a New York judge found him liable for fraud and ordered him to pay a $355 million fine. On Saturday, Trump speaking at a sneaker convention in Philadelphia, facing some boos from the audience. We got to get young people out to vote. 
and you're going to vote, and we're going to turn this thing around. Then traveling to Michigan. But we got to get out and vote. We got to vote like that. And that includes in the primary. His Republican rival, Nikki Haley, taking aim at the former president's legal troubles. The campaign reports came out, and we saw that he spent $50 million of campaign contributions to his campaign on his personal court cases. But Haley is trailing 32 points behind Trump in her home state with the South Carolina primary just a week away. Meanwhile, President Biden, in a call with President Zelensky, said Ukraine's withdrawal from the town of Avdivka was tied to Congress's inability to pass further aid to help the country fight its war with Russia. I spoke with Zelensky this afternoon to let him know that I was confident we're going to get that money keep that country from being overrun by Russia. The Senate already passed funding for Ukraine, but the House has left for a two-week break without considering the bill. Please, everyone remember that dictators do not go on vacation. Before sending aid overseas, House Republicans demand that the U.S. secure its own borders, but they derailed a bipartisan deal in the Senate that included the toughest border security measures in decades after former President Donald Trump opposed it. Johnny Fernandez, ABC News, New York. Keeping Brackenridge Park clean was top of mind for so many people who showed up to the Basura Bash today. The annual event has brought people out to Brack for 29 years to keep the park and its waterways as clean as can be. This year's bash lined up perfectly as heavy rains in 2024 have brought a lot of litter into our waterways. Even our own Garrett Berger was there to help out and, of course, have some fun in the process. What is, <laughs> what is happening there? I never, what is Garrett? I feel like you just never know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, hey, I'm glad that the weather, well, okay, it was a little cold and windy today. Yeah, but really. honestly, a big difference from the weather that we had the past couple of days. Yes. I mean, it was warm. It was humid, and then we had the front move through yep. yesterday evening. I remember I walked outside about 20 minutes after it passed through, and you knew it was, was there. like, oh, wow, it's still winter. Hello. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we were not finished with that just yet. And honestly, don't let the coats go anywhere. Okay. You're going to need them to tomorrow know. morning, too, with the light freeze possible. So, yeah, let's talk all about it. Take a look at this, though. 4 p.m. yesterday, what we were just talking about, mild and muggy. We reached 70 degrees here in the Alamo City, but after we saw the front move through, that cooler and drier air has been filtering into South Central Texas today, 21 degrees cooler at 4 p.m. at 49. Now we have a little bit of cloud cover in place right now. Some mid-level clouds. Those are going to continue to work out of the area through the overnight. So when you combine clearing skies with the calming winds and of course that cooler and drier air in place, temperatures are going to tumble through the overnight. Again, a light freeze is expected briefly by sunrise. First thing tomorrow, low 30s, right around 32 degrees expected here in town, but I think the farther north and west that you go up into the hill country, the higher elevations, some upper 20s possible, 27 in Comfort, 28 in Bernie, 31 in Seguin, 31 in Gonzales as well, places like Floresville and Nixon, it'll be close, maybe a few degrees slightly above freezing, but still before heading to bed tonight, pretty much for all of us in and around the San Antonio area, a good idea to make sure that those light freeze preparations are finished, mainly bringing in the potted plants, making sure your pets have a very warm place to sleep. Sleep. Don't forget about them. And if you're stepping out for any Sunday morning activities first thing tomorrow, you definitely are going to want to bundle up. As far as pipes go, they should be just fine with this go around. So yes, a cold start tomorrow, low 30s. But after that, plenty of sunshine is going to make for a gorgeous into the weekend. 50 degrees expected at noon here in your case that 12 hour forecast. And then into the second half of the day, still cooler than average by about 10 degrees, but nice warming up into the upper 50s here in town. Maybe a few low 60s, especially out west near Las Maples, Utopia, even over to Uvalde. 59 in Rio Medina tomorrow afternoon, 57 in Seguin, 59 as well for places like Nixon, Floresville, as well as Pleasanton over there in Atascosa County. Other than the cold, the wind was the big story today. Take a look at peak wind gusts across the region, near 40 miles per hour. That was our max wind gust here in the Alamo City, clocked in earlier this morning. 29 miles miles per hour in Rock Springs, 33 in Hondo, 36 was the peak wind gust out east there in Gonzales. But you can see winds have dramatically died down across the area and that will continue to be the theme here 
through the overnight and into your Sunday. What those winds have been doing, yes, the cooler air is in place, but also the drier air. Dew points, how we measure the low level moisture in the atmosphere currently in the 20s. It's about 15 to 20 degrees below where we were 24 hours ago, so it is more comfortable to step outside to. That will also be the trend into tomorrow and even into Monday for the most part, but by Tuesday and Wednesday, what's going to happen is we're going to see those winds shift back in from the southeast, and that just opens the door for more of that Gulf moisture, this green color to start to work back into the area. So the humidity is going to start to increase as well, really by Tuesday and Wednesday. Unfortunately, I wish we had something to show for it in terms of rain chances, but as of right now, not looking too impressive. And this is why area of low pressure closer to Missouri and parts of the upper Midwest right now, that's going to continue to work eastward in the coming days. And then we see this big blue H move into the state of Texas. A high pressure system works in, so that's going to keep those rain chances down nothing really to monitor for the foreseeable future into next week. Take a look at this high temperatures quickly return and really start to warm up. So if you like the chillier weather, tomorrow is your day and even into Monday as well. But by Tuesday, we're back into the upper 70s. Wednesday and Thursday, a little taste of spring, low 80s. So we've got everything in the forecast in terms of your temperatures over the next seven days. And I'll leave you with this. A beautiful sunset wow. pic sent in from our friends in Adkins. Absolutely gorgeous. Thanks for sending that in to KSAT Connect. Those always make us happy. Just Agreed. Like Agreed. All right. Thanks, Mia. All right, Mary, it is day two of NBA All-Star Weekend. Yes, it is. It's been a great weekend of pro basketball. All the skills on display. It wrapped up not too long ago, day two, that is. We saw Victor Wembanyama take the floor for the skills challenge with a couple of other first rounders. And we've got some college hoops to show you. A couple of Big 12 matchups featuring top five teams. Stay with us. In Indianapolis, NBA All-Star Saturday night. Victor Wembanyama featured in the skills competition, standing at 7-4 on team first picks. With fellow number one overall draft pick Anthony Edwards and Paolo Bancaro, Wemby showing his rare ball handling skills at his stature. But his teammates might have been having too much fun. At least Edwards, who vowed to only shoot left-handed, didn't work out too well for the first picks. The home team, Team Pacers, won the skills challenge. All right, let's check in now with the first of its kind, NBA versus WNBA three-point challenge between Steph Curry and Sabrina Unescu, two legends in the long-range game. Unescu started her round hot, although Curry goes lights out at the end of his round to win the crown. That event rocked. All right, later in the evening, Mac McClung, defends his dunk contest title after clearing the head of Shaq. He under, earned a perfect score on that one. Now the main event is tomorrow, the All-Star Game. All right, our Larry Ramirez caught up with Wemby after the skills challenge. Yeah, they wanted to have fun, you know, but uh, fun is winning for me. Are you glad it's over now, at least you can go home and rest? And what do you think yeah. the next few days? Yeah, I definitely need it. You know, what, what are the plans to do? Yeah. Man, nothing. I mean, just relax, you know. Be in the nature and the, yeah, because I need that, I need that boost of energy here now. Not have any regret, you know, and uh, have a better record at the end of the of this season than, you know, hopefully we, uh, than what we've won so far and also than last season. The much deserved rest on the horizon for Wembenyama. The 11 and 44 Spurs resume their rodeo road trip and the second half of the NBA season on Thursday against the 31 and 23 Kings in Sacramento. Time to take a look at some Saturday college hoops. Texas men's basketball visiting number three, Houston. First half, Dylan DeSue drives, and the layup doesn't go, but he's there for the putback. Longhorns down seven. Juwan Roberts feeds Javier Francis for the slam. The Cougars were playing bully ball out there, and Texas didn't stand a chance. Houston wins 82-61. The Cougars remain tied atop the Big 12 with 10th ranked Iowa State with six regular season games remaining. The fifth ranked Texas women's basketball team hosting Iowa State. Shaley Gonzalez drives baseline and goes reverse layup to extend the Texas lead to eight points. 
All right, fast forward to the fourth quarter. Longhorns force the turnover. Long pass to Madison Booker, and she dishes it to Deanna Gaston for the easy bucket. That was a clean dub for Texas, 81-60 the final. Texas is second in the Big 12 standings. Let's check out bull riding at the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. We'll show you the best ride of the evening. But first, Tyler Bingham riding second chance. This one didn't end well. Bingham got caught too close for comfort. Hope he's okay. All right, now to the best eight second ride of the night. And the only one, Cooper James riding Bad John. And James right away is in control of this one. He has a great ride. He stays the course. And John, the only rider on the leaderboard by the end of it with a score of 82 points. Beautiful. Later in the show, we head out to the pitch for high school soccer, both boys and girls matchups between John Jay and O'Connor coming your way. Is this your first rodeo coverage? It is remember. my first rodeo coverage. I was going to say, you liking it? It's fun. It's pretty <laughs> intense. I haven't heard you talk about bull riding yet, so <laughs> I think this is great. Yes. She's in, guys. She's in. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. We'll be right back. February is the month dedicated to honoring and celebrating black history. But in order to do that, that history has to be preserved. Those stories have to be told. In this case, that explains we're sharing the ways the stories of the local black community are being shared and remembered right here in San Antonio. This cover right here, it features T.C. Calvert, senior, and at the time, city council person, Sheila McNeil. Um, that was back in 2005. I am Wasim Ali, and I am the owner of the San Antonio Observer, an African-American publication founded in 1995 by my father, Hussein Ali. These are old covers that we did that were, you know, pretty prominent at the time. We pride ourselves on being um, the pulse beat of the community, being in tune with the African-American community. Does this mean it's a publication just for African-Americans? You know, that's always been a myth, uh, and that's why I'm glad that's actually a good question. Uh, this is a African-American publication because it's owned by myself, and the content is basically uh, centered around African-American issues but it's designed for everybody to be able to pick it up and read. It's important that people who don't look like me are interested in the things that are happening in this community. That's how you bring about change, the, the, uh, the exchanging of ideas and understanding where the other side is coming from. This used to be a working garage. Back in 1995, you walk in here, there was a long table along the wall and everybody had their desk and their station. It looked more like a newsroom even though it's in a garage. Now, you know, we're in a digital age, so everything is done via computer. You talked about how the paper has chronicled local black history. Yes. But it's part of it as well, the paper itself. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Every week is a snapshot in time for the city of San Antonio as to what's happening in the city. Every week for us is black history. Right. You know, my, and, and my father, his idea was we're going to be like the New York Post. The way we were going to get everybody's attention, we're going to come with these hard hitting covers that just grab your attention. Being able to understand the plight of the African American community um, and what's actually going on and affecting the uh, African American community. We take that as a huge responsibility. Like this evening, we'll have an opening for this art exhibition. And then tomorrow night, we start uh, with the play. This is Cassandra Parker Nowicki, and I'm the executive director of The Carver. The Carver is a multidisciplinary, multicultural performing and visual arts center. So we celebrate the diverse cultures of our local, national, and global community through the arts. But we do have an emphasis on celebrating the art forms and artistic expressions of the black community. We present uh, or exhibit rather mostly local artists in this space. This was a place for the black community when they weren't allowed in other spaces. Exactly, exactly. So 
these are some of the um, original photographs from the library. Okay, so there is something written above these doors. It reads the colored branch of the San Antonio Library and Auditorium. So that is what the building was named and dedicated as in 1929. It's really important for us to be true to our history and the reason that we exist. Just all of the great legends, right? So Ella Fitzgerald, Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, you name them, they've probably performed here on this stage. What do you think that that means for people who live in this community to know that this space still exists in a different form and for different mm -hmm. purposes, mm -hmm. but a space with that rich history is still up and running? I think it's really important and that gets affirmed every day. We, one, want to celebrate the diversity of our city, but we also want to be sure that those individuals in the community who haven't historically seen themselves represented on stages or in galleries have that opportunity here. G.J. Starnes, he's the first African-American surgeon here in San Antonio. In 1884. Yes. Wow. My name is Taylor Foots, and I'm the exhibit space supervisor for SACAM. We are a nonprofit organization that is focused on collecting, preserving, and sharing African-American history um, and culture from the South Texas region. Are there any specific moments, people, in local San Antonio black history that you think aren't as known as they should be? Well. I have a favorite story that I've learned just from working here that I feel like isn't well enough known, um, and that's the story of Hattie Briscoe. She was um, a teacher here in San Antonio, um, a beloved teacher who was unjustly fired from Phyllis Wheatley High School, and because of that, um, she decides to become a lawyer and ends up being the first black female graduate from St. Mary's Law School and the only black female attorney in Bear County for about 30 years. This building is currently 715 square feet and we'll be moving into a building that's 103,000 square feet. So, quite the jump. Our archive team goes out to different places around the city, churches, um, senior centers, different cultural events, um, and they collect the stories of people who are in attendance of those. Photos, yes. articles they have. Yeah. Family artifacts, anything, recipes, um, memories, anything that they have, it's all important. Mary Lillian Andrews, she's a 17-year-old activist, really helps to desegregate lunch counters here in San Antonio. When you don't know your history or it's lost or overlooked and you don't feel, I think, a desire to aspire to something greater. All you have is what you see around you um, and when you know your history, you know what you can overcome and you know what you can achieve. What a wonderful way to put that. To check out all of our KSAT Explains coverage, scan this QR code on your screen. Every episode explains a different topic, and you can catch them all on the KSAT YouTube page, KSAT.com, and the KSAT Plus app. Another look at weather when we return. Welcome back to the Night Beat. Heading back outside with live cam. Temperatures continue to drop. Low 40s. We even have some 30s out there in and around the San Antonio area. Skies are clearing. And through the overnight, it's going to be cold out there. Again, light freeze expected by sunrise tomorrow. Before we can get there, take a look at the Almanac data for today. We were not close to a freeze. 40 degrees, the low temperature in San Antonio. The high temperature officially was 56. That was actually at midnight before we really started to see this colder air completely seep into the region. So we had a midnight high of 56 degrees this afternoon, upper 40s. That was all we were able to climb up to by about 3 to 4 o'clock. Most of these numbers around midnight, 55 the high temperature in New Braunfels, 58 in Gonzales, 64 the farther south that you go in Catula, 61 over in Carrizo Springs. Now as we look ahead to the upcoming week, when it comes to those daily high temperatures, the temperature roller coaster continues. Still cool out there tomorrow 
tomorrow, upper 50s, but we warm by at least 10 degrees into Monday and Tuesday. Spring returns by the middle of the week, 80s Wednesday and into Thursday, and then another front arrives just ahead of next weekend, dropping those highs back into the 70s. So we'll talk a little bit more about that second cold front that looks to move in ahead of next weekend coming up after the break.